Hi, I'm Cindy, and this is Joy and Bella Chica, and we're at Still Point Studies, and we're, today we're talking about Latin names and chemotypes. And so you're probably wondering what's so special about Latin names and chemotypes. And to be perfectly honest with you, um, it's one of the most important things that you need to know when working with essential oils uh, therapeutically. So let's say that you see a recipe. You're either reading your favorite magazine, or better, or more likely, you'll be on Facebook just scrolling around. And so someone has this great recipe for something, and you say, gee, I think I'm going to make it. So the recipe calls for lavender, chamomile, and thyme. And so you say, oh, this sounds good. But my question to you is, what lavender, what chamomile, and what thyme? So you don't know. You don't know just by looking at the common name. You need to delve a little bit deeper and then say, which rosemary, which thyme, which eucalyptus, which lavender. Right. And that's where we get into genus and species. So genus is, uh, genus is how closely the plants are related. Um, and species are direct characteristics of the plants. So there's leaf structure, flower structure, and reproduction. So if you think of genus as a family name or family, and then you think of species as two kids, that's the difference. They both belong to the same genus, but they're very different, although they share some of the characteristics. So they might have the same nose, they might have the same ears, but different eyes, different hair color, different builds. And probably different personalities. Different personalities, but we'll get to that later. Personality is a big deal, but that comes a little bit later. In this recipe, the lavender that we were thinking of is lavandula latifolia, which is spike lavender. And the chamomile that we were thinking of is chamomilum nobile. Which is which Roman is, chamomile. Right. And the thyme that we were thinking of is thymus vulgaris chemotype geraniol. And so that breaks us down into yet another level. You have genus, you have species, and now you have chemotype. And sometimes you'll see chemotype listed as CT. And if you've ever been curious as to what that CT means, it stands for chemotype. And so this is, so this is where um, the family structure gets a little different. So you have a parent, and that's the genus. And then you have the species, which are siblings. But then you can have the chemotype, and so that would be identical twins. And so they look exactly the same and you know the difference only when one opens up their mouth and is a... A jerk? <laughs> is a jerk and the other one is nice and, and very polite. And so that's the difference. So, what a, so what, a, what a chemotype is, is they're two plants and they look exactly the same. They look exactly the same until you start working with them and the chemistry is completely different. So if we had two rosemary plants in front of us, you wouldn't know necessarily by looking at them that they were different chemotypes. They would look exactly identical like those identical twins. Chemotypes are neat, but you have to be really careful um, because if you use the wrong chemotype, you could be making a big error in your blending. And so um, one story is uh, back in the day when we first started working with essential oils, we were doing massage. And I wanted to use uh, basil for um, one of my massages. So uh, we, were, we bought it from this company, which I won't name, and we bought a little bottle of basil. And we got it. And you opened it up and it smelled like pesto. And the botanical name was Osimum basilicum, which is the genus and species for basil. So I said to Cindy, I said, this is great. Look, this smells so good. So we looked to see what it would be for a 16 ounce and it was reasonable. So we said, well, let's get the 16 ounce because then we'd be able to use it and blend with it and all of this. And so we did. So we ordered the 16 ounce and we got a 16 ounce of this basil and the botanical name on the label was Asomum basilicum, just like it should be. So then I opened it up and I smelled it and it smelled like licorice. And so I said to Cindy, I said, isn't this amazing that this, this oil smells so different when you have a big quantity of it instead of a little bottle? But little did we know is that we had two different kinds of chemotypes. The one that smelled it like pesto, like basil, was um, Osmum basilicum chemotype linalool. The one that smelled like licorice was Osmum basilicum chemotype methyl shavacol. The difference is is that linalool is a very safe 
chemical component, and methyl shavacol is a very serious chemical component that you need to know what to do with. So they are definite safety concerns where linalool is a monoterpenol and it's pretty safe for everybody. Methyl shavacol is an ether, not so safe for everybody, and something you really want to know the safety concerns you with. You would never, ever, ever, ever. You don't interchange them. them. No. They're not interchangeable. Absolutely not. But if you don't know about <clears throat> chemotypes, and if you really don't know your oils, you would be like us, and you'd be like, wow, this just smells different, like what kind of basil it is, without realizing it was a very, very, um, let's put it this way, um, basil linalool is like a vitamin, and basil methyl shavacol is like Vicodin, and so you would use them in that way. One you have to be very careful with, and the other is really safe for everyday use. So, there are different factors, actually, that create, you know those rosemary plants that I was talking about? They look exactly the same. Well, the factors that create the difference in the chemistry are rainfall, the geography, sunlight, pests, elevation, many of the environmental factors that play into the growth pattern of that plant. So they could be growing in the same, same location on other side of the mountain. People in our classes, they say, oh, that's kind of like wine. One side of the mountain gets a lot of sun, and the other side of the mountain gets not so much sun, and it creates a different, completely different wine. Same thing with plants. Same thing with those two rosemary plants. And the way that you know, so let's say you have uh, two oils, and you know it's rosemary, rosemary. The way that you know what chemotype and what chemical you're dealing with is you need to have a GCMS report which plenty of you know about, I'm sure. So GCMS, you've probably seen this, GCMS stands for, the GC is gas chromatography, and the MS is mass spectro spectrometry. It's not easy to say. And what we do is when we get an essential oil in <clears throat> from our distiller, we send it to our chemist to get a GCMS report done so that we know exactly what chemistry and what, how much of a percentage of each chemical component is in the essential oil that we sent off to the chemist. To me, the GCMS report is like a blood test, a blood test of the oil. So it tells you the different percentages of um, the different components, it tells you how many components are in it, and it gives you the, the range. The thing about um, how people are looking at GCMS reports um, today in the industry is that they're just focused on the GCMS report for everything. So people are under the impression that if a company or if you can get a GCMS report on a particular oil, that you have a quality oil, mm -hmm. and that's not true. The GCMS report is strictly a quantitative tool. It just tells you what and how much is in the oil, not the quality of the oil. And so lots of people get that confused and everyone is looking for good oils. Everybody wants to make sure they're not getting ripped off. Everybody wants to make sure that they're not getting junk. And the that only, they're not adulterated. And the only way that you can know that is you want to have the GCMS to see if it's pure or not true. And you want the GCMS because you want to know if it, uh, what the components are in it. And that's true too. But the way that you know your oils is that you just know your oils. So there's a relationship that you'll have with your oil that you'll know if you get a good, uh, if you get a quality oil or not. If you think of it like this, if you have cream, you're making a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, and then you pour the cream in and it curdles, well then that's not good cream. And if you pour it in and it looks golden like this, then it's good cream. And so that you have to know your oils. You really can't rely on somebody else's information. So when you're creating your blends, it is really important to know the chemistry of the essential oil, especially if it has different chemotypes. We had one lady who wanted, she was an esthetician, she wanted to buy lavender. Lavender is definitely known as a great skin friendly oil and she was creating a blend for, to use on the face, for people's faces. And so she placed an order and I looked at her order and she ordered Lavendula Stoetis, which is a lavender but it has a different chemistry than Lavendula angustifolia, which is the typical lavender that most people use in skin-friendly blends. The Lavendula stoichis doesn't even smell like a lavender. It is a heavy ketone, camphoraceous 
aroma. And if you didn't know it was a lavender because either we told you or because you saw it on the bottle, there's no way that you would know that this was a part of the lavender family. So we called her up and we said, are you sure that you want the lavender? And she was ordering a nice quantity of it and she was making a lot of stuff, a lot of product. And she wanted the lavender stoetis. So as long as you know what you're ordering, what you're getting, and what you're gonna, the chemistry of what you're gonna get, then that's totally fine. But just be educated when it comes to different genus, different species, and different chemotypes. And some oils are supposed to be pricey. So a lot of times people will be shopping and you'll be looking on a site and let's say it calls for helichrysum. That's a good example because helichrysum is the genus. And then the species, there's helichrysum italicum, there's helichrysum splendidum, there's helichrysum patulum, there's helichrysum odorticium, there's helichrysum bractiferium. And so what helichrysum do you need if it just says helichrysum? So what happens is, is when, and helichrysum is great for the skin. So what happens is somebody wants to make um, a skin blend, some facial blend, wrinkle blend, or something like that. And so they know they need helichrysum. So they come on the site, they look at helichrysum, and they see all of our helichrysms. The difference is, is that helichrysum italicum is pricey. So you're looking at 15 mil for hundreds of dollars. And the other is 24, $25. And if you don't know the difference and the species you're looking for, you end up buying a helichrysum gymnocephalum, which <clears throat> is the um, equivalent of a eucalyptus. And you don't want to be putting eucalyptus on your face. See, that's the, the good story. That is, yes. So when we first were newbies in the aromatherapy world, somebody gave us a recipe, a facial recipe, using helichrysum. This was it. We were at, we were at a class, right? We were at a class. And so the teacher is talking. And so the teacher is saying, they're going to share their facial recipe with us. So th this is like kind of like how like you, you end up drinking the Kool-Aid without even realizing it, right? So there I am. And I'm looking at the teacher, and she says she's going to share the facial recipe. And everybody gets ready. And I'm looking. Pen in hand. To write I'm, it down. Yes. And I'm looking at her, and I'm saying, your skin doesn't look good. But she gives a recipe. And the recipe was helichrysum, cystus, geranium, and rosa rubiginosa, which is rose hip oil. Neat was the recipe. So you put one on neat, put the second one on neat. And so we looked at the prices, and so we said, we can't afford that helichrysum, so we'll buy the cheap one. So we ended up buying helichrysum gymnocephalum. And this is also why you want to make sure that your instructors, and you want to make sure that your essential oil company knows their oils too. Because when I questioned the professor there and I said, what helichrysum? She said, anyone you want. So we bought the cheapest one. And so we came home and that's what we did. We put helichrysum gymnocephalum on and then we put cystis on, then we put geranium on. And the next day I went for my first facial and the esthetician said, what are you using on your face? And I told her, but I had all of these little pus pockets. That's that were, a good story. That were quite visible underneath her big magnification mirror. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. Yes. It was. So that's, that's a really good example of why you need to know the Latin name or genus and species of each essential oil. You really don't want to be putting eucalyptus on your face. No, and, and you don't. And, and the thing is, is that you need to know because certain people have sensitization to certain chemicals. So there, there are two things that happen if you put an essential oil on and, um, and you have a reaction. Either you'll have an irritation, and so that would be like I put oil on here and then I get a rash here. That's irritation. Um, the other one is sensitization, and that's like I put oil on here and then I break out all over my back. And that's sensitization and that's an allergic response. And so oftentimes, once someone is sensitized to an oil or a specific component, they're sensitized to all of them. And that's where the chemistry really, really is important to know. So one of my friends um, um, took a weekend workshop and then she wanted to open up a practice. So one of her friends came to have a blend made. And so I think um, the person that came for the blend um, w w had a congestion and stuff. And she said to my friend, I'm allergic to tea tree. So the friend said, okay. I won't use tea tree. The friend, and so she says, I am going to use Kajaput. Kajaput. And so Kajaput 
is she didn't know this, but Kajaput, the AKA name is white tea tree. So she put the Kaja put on the lady and the lady had a full allergic reaction, had to go to the doctor, had to get shots, the whole bit. I think she ended up in the ER. She did because, and the, and the thing is, is that if my friend knew that Kaja put was also a Malaluka, because that's the, the genus of tea tree and it's the genus of Kaja put, Malaluka, she wouldn't have used it. Here at Still Point Aromatics, we have several different species, genus and species of a bunch of different oils. There are many oils that do have the same genus, different species that you could purchase and that you could use. So one of the um, genuses is Boswellia. Boswellia is a frankincense. So Boswellia sacra, you've heard of. There's Boswellia carteri, Boswellia feriana, Boswellia rive, and Boswellia serrata. And those are just a couple. There, there are. There are almost a hundred different species of frankincense. I think there's almost 200 actually. And so um, depending, on, depending on what you want to use, what, depending on the condition that you're using it for would depend upon the oil that you would choose. So like people come into the shop all the time and frankincense is a pretty popular essential oil. And so they'll come in and they'll say, I want to buy some frankincense. And we usually say, okay, so what are you going to use this frankincense for? Most of the time, most of the time people come in and they want to use frankincense for um, spiritual or they want to ingest it for anti-cancer purposes, which um, is a complete fallacy. So um, they'll, usually they'll choose a frankincense that they, they like the aroma of. So basically we answer them, there are different frankincenses that we have here at Still Point. They have different genus, different, uh, the same genus, different species. Countries of origin are quite different. And sometimes the aromas are different. And then sometimes we have one specifically that the chemistry is completely different. And then people start to say, oh, I didn't know that. And so they'll start smelling them, right? And then they'll find their favorite aroma. And I always ask them what they're going to use it for because there's one of the frankincenses that we have which does have this completely different chemistry which is Boswellia freiriana. Yeah and that leans more towards respiratory than the other. The rest of the Boswellia freiriana actually is called the king of frankincense. And it smells completely different and it does have a different chemistry than those other frankincenses that we mentioned. True and so that's why you also want to know um, the genus species because if you think that you're ordering um, Boswellia carteri, and you order Feriana, you're not gonna, you're not gonna like it. We'll, we'll get, we'll get calls sometimes. We'll get emails saying, "I bought this frankincense, and it doesn't smell anything like frankincense. It smells like an old house, an old sock, an old food." And we say, "Well, what one were you looking for?" And they have not a clue. So you need to know what you're looking for. Same thing with the basil's, right? Same thing with the basil's. Like Joy was talking about before, the basil's can smell completely different. We have three different basil's. And the basils are tricky though, because the basils have the different genus and species, and the basils also have the chemotype. Holy basil has the botanical name Osmum sanctum. And then sweet basil has the botanical name Osmum basilicum chemotype linalool. And exotic basil has the botanical name um, Osmum basilicum chemotype methyl shavacol. So the basils are tricky, they have all three. Right. And then we were talking about helichrysms before, and same thing. You always want to go, for me, I always say, what's the purpose of choosing this essential oil? Because then people will say, well, which one should I buy? And so with the helichrysms, if you're looking for something that's skin healing, skin friendly, and you want um, wound healing for the skin, helichrysum italicum is the premier essential oil that is known for skin healing. It is. However, we have all those other helichrysms that Joy mentioned before. And you say, well, what the heck do I use those for? And so those are really for um, pain or for um, respira respiratory or for just general support. And huge difference, like Joy was saying before, in price. Helichrysum italicum, if you're looking for something for healing for the skin, you're going to have to pay that little bit of an extra price for the helichrysum italicum than you will for the other helichrysms. And if you happen to find helichrysum italicum on a tremendous sale, you're not getting pure helichrysum italicum. 
they're little tiny um, yellow flowers and they don't yield that much oil. So it takes tons and tons and tons of the flower, the flowering tops to make the helichrysum italicum. Essential oil, for Essential sure. Essential oil. So, um, so now you're probably all confused, right? <laughs> Genus, species, chemotype. So think of it like this. Think of a family and then think of three children. There's um, um, a, a, a little boy and then there's two little girls that are identical twins. Okay, so that, think of them as basil. Okay, so the little boy is Osmum sanctum. The little boy is holy basil. The two little girls are Osmum basilicum chemotype. And so how do you know which one? Well, this little girl is nasty and this little girl is nice. Nasty is the methyl shavacol. Nice is the linalool. That's a good way of putting yeah, it. I think yeah. so. It's great. So there's also another um, essential oil, thyme. Thyme is vulgaris. That's the um, Latin name, genus, species, thyme is vulgaris. And in that recipe that we started with, Joy was like thyme. And then she finally said thyme is vulgaris, chemotype. Geraniol. Geraniol. OK, so thyme is vulgaris, vulgaris, chemotype, geraniol is really a soft, lovely, lemony essential oil. Doesn't smell anything like the stuff that you cook with and you bake with and you put in your stuffing and your turkey in Thanksgiving time. No. <clears throat> Nothing really herbaceous about it. However, it's got the same Latin name, thymus vulgaris. That's where the chemotype comes in. And that's why you would choose chemotype geraniol, which is really gentle and skin friendly, Thymus vulgaris chemotype thymol, it's very harsh, very aromatic, very pungent aroma, and really can be tough on the skin. Thymus um, vulgaris chemotype thymol, thymol reminds me of chicken. That's what I call it, chicken. Because when you overstuff your chicken, that's what it tastes like. Perf and I did that once. Perfume. And way too much thyme in my stuffing. Way too much. So there are a bunch of different um, chemotypes, though, for thymes. There's, there's Time, um, there's time chemotype geraniol, there's time chemotype linalool, there's time chemotype thulianol, and there's time chemotype thymol. And I think there's a bor borneol as well, chemotype borneol. So, borneol. Yes. And so the thing about chemotypes is most of them you can't interchange. So the time vulgaris chemotype geraniol or linalool are the gentler ones. So those are ones that maybe if you were dealing with some kind of um, candida issue or something like that, and if you did use the oils as aromatic medicine, that is one of that, those are the oils that you would think to put in like, let's say a suppository, a vaginal suppository. And they're generally safe for kids and skin friendly. If you put thyme, chemotype thyme oil in a vaginal suppository, this would be very unpleasant. Not a good thing. Not good no. at all. No. The two that sometimes can get confusing are the rosemaries. Back to those rosemary bushes that we had in front of us. There's Rosemarinus officinalis chemotype cineol. Most of you have heard 1,8 cineol, chemotype cineol. It's one of probably the most common rosemaries out there. Yeah. And it's a great respiratory oil. So you would use Rosemarinus officinalis chemotype cineol in your respiratory blend. Then we have this lovely Rosemarinus officinalis chemotype verbenone, which is great for the skin. And also respiratory. And it's also a great mucolytic, for then, sure. And we have a third one, um, Rosemarinus officinalis chemotype camphor. And so what that means, it, well, you just have to remember, the word that follows chemotype is telling you that that is a good, um, that is, there's a good amount of that component in the oil. So if you think about food, I always think about food. I love food. So if you think about pizza, let's think about it that way. So you have three pizzas, and they're all pizza. Pizza, pizza, pizza. This pizza has all eggplant on it. This pizza has all sausage on it. And this pizza has all cheese on it. And so that would tell you this would be pizza chemotype eggplant, pizza chemotype sausage, pizza chemotype cheese. And that's the, and so so you knew if you were going to have the pizza chemotype sausage, you were going to get a really good dose of sausage. And the chemotypes has to do with the chemical families. Correct. So, um, so the definition of a chemotype is same genus, genus 
same species, different chemistry. Okay, and it's not different chemical family, it's different chemistry. Correct. So you have, um, let's say you have a linalool, that's a monoterpenol. You have methylshavacol, that's an ether. And then when we're talking about the rosemaries, you have chemotype 1,8-cineol, which is an oxide. And then you have chemotype verbenone, which is a ketone. And the same thing with chemotype camphor, it's a ketone. So it really depends on what, it really depends on what you, you need the oil for. Purpose, purpose, purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. <laughs> so what is your favorite chemical family? Gee, my chem favorite chemical family has to be uh, sesquiterpenes. Why? I love the rich, thick oils. Like? Like patchouli. Okay. I love patchouli. What's your favorite chemical family? <laughs> Not that. <laughs> my favorite, let's see, my favorite chemical, well I have a couple, but my most favorite chemical family are the ethers. How come? Because the ethers are, well, they're, they're interesting. They're tough, strong, and soft all at the same time. So ethers are like star anise, fennel, um, tarragon, exotic basil. Do you have a favorite one? No, I, I think I like, star, I like star anise a lot and I like fennel a lot. Really the reason that I, um, I favor the ethers is because ether, ether rich oils are um, very good for emotional issues. So um, I struggle with emotional stuff sometimes, and so the ethers, the ethers, when used correctly, can really help balance out the emotional body and also balance um, issues with the brain. When overused, then they're hallucinogenic, and so that's why it, it's a chemical family that um, you really need to you need to know how to use. There's a story that Nostradamus. I'm not sure he was using essential oils though, but back in the day, Nostradamus, he used nutmeg because meristocin is the ether in nutmeg to help with his visions. So that's why I like that. I like ethers. Joy's very transparent and she's gonna tell you exactly like it is. So she's, yes, yes. She loves the oils that have anything to do with the head I do. and the brain. So another group that has to do with that are oxides. Oxides are cephalic, um, cephalic, having to do with the head. And um, that's where rosemary, um, eucalyptus, they, they're high oxide. It's that eucalyptus -y smell, that's the oxide. And they're, they're very good to do. They help with clarity, they help with clear thinking and sharpness hmm. of the brain. Yeah. Laurel leaf is a great one too. Laurel leaf is a good one, yeah. See, so then if you, if you mix the, um, the therapeutic and the energetics together, laurel leaf is great for memory, sharpness, and being like kind of on the ball. And then energetically, laurel leaf is good for protection and courage. So it's like having a sword. Yeah, like having a sword. Sharp. So some of the other chemical families, um, there's monoterpenes. So oils that belong to that family are the citruses, the pines, um, tea tree also belongs to that family. Then there are monoterpenols, and that would be... Like sweet marjoram. Peppermint is a monoterpenol, has high monoterpenols. Um, basil. Basil, basil. chemotype linalool is high in, in monoterpenols. And tea tree. Tea tree has terpenine for all. That's high in monoterpenols too. And there are sesquiterpenes. You did that. Right, that's my favorite. Sesquiterpenols. That's why you like that one too. I do, I love sesquiterpenols. So, um, so let's see, sesquiterpenols would be sandalwood. Patchouli. Patchouli, cedarwood. Cedarwoods. Those are those deep, thick, rich ones, the real earthy ones that I love. And, and sesquiter, sesquiterpenol oils are quite anti-inflammatory. They're, they're really good for inflammation. We talked about oxides, so we have rosemarinus, officinalis. Anytime you see CT, chemotype, 1,8-cineol, it's, it's gonna be an oxide. 1,8-cineol is the main oxide component that you'll find that's out there. And here's some trivia for you. It's called 1,8-cineol because they, so it looks like a little stop sign, and then it, it kind of like that with an O in the middle, oxygen in the middle, 
And the reason it's called 1,8-cineal is because that oxygen is bonded to the first and the eighth carbon. Just a little trivia for you. Yeah, it's a little trivia. Not many people know this. And then there are aldehydes. Aldehydes. Aldehydes are, um, they're the lemony scented. There are two types of aldehydes, actually. There's the lemony scented ones, like Melissa and lemongrass, and then there are the cinnamony ones, and it's cinnamon aldehyde and cassia. And then we have esters. Esters are great. Esters are wonderful. Esters are like geranium, helichrysum, clary sage, jasmine, palmarosa, neroli. Oh, we could go on with these lovely oils. They're, they're nice oils. They're skin friendly. And also, um, esters are also good for um, depression, but not, they're good for the immune stimulant, but not because they're immune stimulant. Esters are really special because esters are good for boosting the immune system. But it's not because that they're chemically an immune stimulant, it's because they're good for for the emotional body so they help reduce stress. They help reduce stress and so they're anxiolytic and so because of that they're known to be um, immune stimulants. And if you haven't gotten the, the gist yet, Joy likes to make these analogies with food. She's already talked about her pizzas and she's talked about the overstuffed chicken and the turkey. For her, what are esters? Esters are macaroni and cheese. They're creamy, they're just magnificent. I love esters. They're soft. They're soft. gentle and kind. Macaroni and cheese is comfort food. So, you know, a good way to, to so, so I, this is like a little overwhelming, all these chemical families, all this chemotype, all these species. It sure can be. So a good way to kind of straighten it, and it's a good way to straighten out in your head is if you can maybe give the chemical families a name. Meaning, like let's, I have, we have, um, I have four little dogs. This is Bella, I have Jasmine, Star, and Rosie. And so if I was going to name them chemical families, <laughs> Bella would be a phenol, right? Oh. That's a really rough and tough group, oregano, um, mountain savory. They're anti-infectious and they're tough and they're sharp. And you would never believe that about Bella, but believe <laughs> me, she's a phenol. And Jasmine would probably be maybe an aldehyde because she seems creamy and soft and lemony on the top and then she's vicious underneath. So Jasmine would be an aldehyde. Star would be an ester. For sure. And, and Rosie would be an aldehyde? No. Ether. Okay. Rosie Rosie's would be an ether. ether. So anyway, so if you can, it, my point is, is that if you can take personalities, if you know people like that, or you have pets. Or food. Or food. And if you can connect them up with the chemical families, it will really help clarify it for you. So then that way, if you know you have an ester rich oil, you kind of know exactly what it's going to do. Or if you have an oil that's chemotype methyl shavacol and you know it's an ether, you're going to never to use it on kids. And so the chemical families are important. You, you, need, you need to know the whole banana. You need the whole sundae. So we get a lot of questions sometimes because we have all these, let's say, times. OK, we have three different times, right? And so we have time is vulgaris. They're all time is vulgaris, different chemotypes. And they'll say, which one should I get? And it always goes back to purpose. What do you want to use this time for? And how are you going to use it? So if you're looking for a time that's going to be anti-infectious and you want that phenol rich, strong personality type, then you're looking for time is vulgaris, chemotype thymol. If you're looking for something that is still a time, but the one that's skin friendly and less irritating and not phenol rich, the geraniol or the linalool, chemotype geraniol, chemotype linalool are gonna be monoterpenols. They're gonna be softer. They're gonna be gentler and not skin irritating. So you don't have to get them all. You don't have to get all the times to get the time is vulgaris action, but do you want anti-infectious? Or do you want something that's a little bit more gentle and skin friendly? Yes, that's good. Good. And so, um, and, and so also, so. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. So, so there are some oils, there are some essential oils that you, you don't need to get them all. In fact, they'll all do the same thing. So you just need to get your favorite. So lavender is an example of that. Lavender and Gustaf lavandula and gustifolia is an example of that. You can get them from all different countries. And the chemistry will 
differ slightly, but basically they're all lavandula and gustifolia, so get the one that you like. Either get the one that you like because of the country or get the one that you like because of the aroma. But the chemistry is really going to be pretty much the same, so you don't need all of them. So what we've done, because this can be really overwhelming, people who come into our little shop and that are looking for lavenders, we have the lavender separated, we have the frankincense separated, the helichrysms, all the ones that can get a little tricky with the chemistry and the countries and they're not quite sure which one to buy. And so then we separate them out and we say, if you're looking for a true lavender, what country? And then they'll just start to smell. If you're looking for lavender, true lavender, which is lavandula and gustifolia, just smell them. See which one you like. And if you're not there to smell which one you like, pick your country. Pick your favorite country. Because if it's lavandula and gustifolia, you pretty much know you're getting true lavender. Bella says great job, because Bella loves chemistry. Um, we know this is a really huge topic, chemistry, and so we're going to make a really fun foaming soap blend right now that kind of integrates chemistry, chemotypes, and smells really great. You know, I used to teach, well, we both did. We both taught fifth grade. And so sometimes we would be teaching stuff that was kind of dry and kind of boring. I mean, this is so not boring to us. I mean, I guess we're like little um, geeks, chemistry geeks. I mean, I think it's fascinating, you know, and um, I, I think it's just so amazing how just one um, molecule, one could be, and then whole, you have a whole new chemical family. So to me, it's fantastic. But then I also get very excited when my quick books um, balance out, reconcile, and so, but I promise you, um, it's something if you delve into, you won't be sorry, because this, although you might be saying, what does this have to do with anything about making blends, and all I can say is that it gives you a foundation that really sinks into your um, knowledge base, that gives you such a good support, so um, it's worth learning, and like I would tell the kids in class, just stick with it, and then we could do something fun, so if you stuck with us, Right, now we're going to do something fun. We're now going to start making our foamer, which is a really great um, thing to use in the bathroom, either is as a hand soap, so we have one right by the sink in the bathroom, or some people really like to use them in the shower. I like to use them in the shower. Because they foam up and they're really fun. So this one, um, in this video, we're going to be using Castile soap as our base or our carrier because there really is just soap to this recipe and you want to fill it up <clears throat> okay ready Bella okay. you pour okay usually I have a, a pump in our big uh, gallon bottles but sometimes with these foamers especially and Castile soap and this is just plain Castile soap with those pumps from this big gallon bottle you get extra air in here. So I like to just pour, if possible, into the foamer bottle. And you want to fill it up, not all the way to the top, because you have to have some room to put the pump back in. Otherwise, need, it'll spill all over. You need room for the pump, and you need room for the oils. And so what oils are we going to use? So we're going to use three oils, um, rosemary, spike lavender, and thyme. So the rosemary is the rosemary chemotype verbenone, spike lavender is lavandula latifolia, and the thyme is chemotype thymol. Why did we choose those? Well, this, um, this foamer that we're creating today is actually multi-purpose. So because we have all these different chemotypes, it'll be wonderful antiviral, antibacterial hand foaming soap. The verbenone is a skin-friendly chemotype. And the thymol is a phenol, and that's an anti-infectious chemotype. So that's what you want in your hand soap or a hand sanitizer. You want something that's going to clean your hands and also get rid of any kind of germs. And the spike lavender, first of all, we're using it for aroma purposes because it's going to add a nice floral aroma. But this, as I said before, it's going to be multi-purpose. So we're going to have antiviral, antibacterial properties with the essential oils that we're using. And it was also really good, this recipe was really good for anybody who's got any kind of arthritis or achy, achiness in their hands or their joints because of the oils that we chose. It's going to be a great pain relieving, analgesic, hand foaming soap.
So we filled our bottle and we have room for our oils. And so people ask us all the time, what's the dilution? And in a foaming soap or in a uh, foaming uh, bath gel or regular bath gel or shaving cream, you just go by aroma. So it really is up to your personal preference because <clears throat> you're going to put it on and then you are going to wash it down the drain. It's gonna go right down the drain. And just as an aside, um, cold pressed citruses that we spoke about um, another time, um, they are phototoxic. But it doesn't matter if you use cold pressed citruses, it doesn't matter if you use a phototoxic oil in a soap. So you could use any of the oils and have no concern about it. Another point, because it is going to go down the drain, sometimes I don't, I do not, not sometimes, I really do not like to use expensive pricier oils. Like I don't put neroli, I don't use rose in a foaming soap because it's, it's quick, it's momentary, it's not going to last very long. You're going to wash and it's going to go right down the drain. If you want to use oils uh, like that, you're better off putting them in a cream and then you could apply it after you um, shower. Something that'll last a lot longer than just that I'm going to wash my hands and bye bye down the drain it goes. Okay, I'm going to start with our Time Time All in our blend because A, it's going to have the most potent aroma and as Joyce said before, it's a phenol so you don't really need or want to use that much. No. Besides, it smells like chicken. <laughs> okay, so I ended up putting about 20 drops of thyme, thyme all, in this. We have eight ounces of Castile soap, so we have a lot of carrier to go with. Next, I'm gonna add spike lavender, lavandula latifolia. I ended up putting about 30 drops of the spike lavender in there. You want to give it a sniff? Nice. nice. And then the last essential oil I'm going to put in is the rosemary from uh, Corsica. This is our rosemary verbenone. We actually have two rosemary verbenones. One comes from Corsica and the other one from South Africa. The one and they're from both lovely. The one from Corsica though is um, it's like magic to me. It comes from our Corsican distiller and um, she is just fantastic. When I write to her, I have to write in French, so I use Google Translate and sh she's very kind because I know it probably doesn't make any sense and I have to refrain from saying love ya to her because I do, I love her, but I think if I tell her love ya, then it's going to scare her and she won't sell me the oil. Okay, I ended up putting about 20 drops of the rosemary as well. That's nice. Good job. Let me smell. Oh, that's lovely. So the thing is, is the best part, I mean, I like soap and stuff, I like cream a lot, but the best part of the foamer, if you've never used one, yeah, the best part of the foamer is, that. <laughs> this is the best part of the foamer. Don't you think? You don't really need that much, but Joy just loves the foam. I do. See? <laughs> so thanks so much for joining us here at Still Point Studies. And if you have any questions, please visit our Facebook page at Still Point Online. And when you make a foamer, think of us. <laughs> so we're so glad um, that you've joined us here at Still Point Online. And we have a lot of fun creating these classes. So if you have any ideas or um, you'd like to learn a little bit more about something, just drop us a line, Keep us, um, join us on Facebook. We have a, a great group of, of individuals that you guys can correspond with. And um, any questions or thoughts or ideas, just drop us a line. And we love you guys. <laughs> so come join us and come join Bella Chica. <laughs>